Hello, this is Ken, your podcast preacher, and I want to welcome you back to Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effect of working out the will and calling of God in our lives. The title of this message is Governing Authorities, Kingdom and Earth. So we are not of the world, so the scripture says, right? Therefore, we don't have to listen to anyone but God, Jesus, and or the Holy Spirit, right? Hmm, let's crack DCOM open and to find a modern-day four-letter word with nine actual letters. Authority. The power to determine, adjudicate, or otherwise settle issues or disputes. Jurisdiction. The right to control, command, or determine. The power or right delegated or given. Authorization. Who has the authority to grant permission? A person or body of persons in whom authority is vested as a governmental agency. The Housing Authority provides rental assistance payments to low-income residents. Usual authorities are persons having the legal right to make and enforce the law. Another form is an accepted source of information. So in today's world, there is a great attack against those in authority. Now, we cannot blame the God blind from acting the fool and doing things that a person of God can see as harmful or even just plain stupid. What? You want a modern-day example? Okay. So here's a sign of the times with the sign as big as the moon. Defund the popo. Of course criminals are in favor of such an action. Hello? Why wouldn't they want not those in authority to be in authority? Remove someone from a position of authority and someone else will fill it. That's how it works. Self-promotion is the easiest way to get something you are not equipped or called to be in. Now behind these type of statements is the one who attempted to usurp his authority and extend it to the next position above his. The problem was that there was already somebody sitting in that chair and he didn't vacate it. Isaiah 14, 12, 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the Mount of Congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. What? The trick has already been played. But so because he lost in heaven, he is trying the same thing down here on earth. And that is to displace those who are placed in positions of authority by God and fill them with his especially obedient children. The strategy is not new. In this message, you will see who is really the boss man and how he expects us to behave in a world that is inherently against authority. It happened in heaven, and it happens on earth. My first foundational block of scriptures are written by John. Perhaps his knowing that he is loved by God has enabled him to see this revelation. John 8, 23. And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. What a declaration. Well, imagine how fast Jesus' preaching would clear out some of today's church buildings. Hey, but don't worry, because for these types of churches, they will just pull together another evangelistic crusade and invite all them devils back into the house of God. Success. He turned the carp loose, but we got them back in the nets. Oh, well, let's move on. John eighteen thirty six, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So it stands to reason that if Jesus is not of this world, then neither is his kingdom. So far, so clear, right? John fourteen thirty, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. So then as we further define this message, we transition to answering the question, Jesus, if you are not running things down here, though you are God, then who is? We won't focus on the for the ruler of this world is coming section, as it applies to the cross more powerfully than it can help here. But what we do want to look at is that Jesus stated that there is a ruler of this world, and by his own admonition, it isn't him. So at this juncture and the purpose of this message, we want to address those who say that because I too am not of this world, I do not have to act in accordance with its governing rules, procedures, and laws. 
My boss man is Jesus and the rest of you can leap off a bridge. I have worked with such thinking in my careers and through my searching a matter out, discovered that although Jesus is not of this world, and though he is at this time not the ruler of this world, he has commanded us to pay taxes anyways, to be obedient, to obey. Watch, you will see, it's classic Jesus all the way. 1 John 5.19 We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So do you sometimes feel when standing on dry land, it's as though you are standing on a ship on rough seas? That's because of the scripture. Just kidding. Maybe. The devil knows if he can just rock a by us to sleep, he can get back to doing what he is here for. What is he here for? To keep you from getting to heaven. What a victory for him if he can convince you that he is real but God is not. To keep you from entering into the land he can no longer access. You see, losers who lose want also to see others lose. It's sort of a justification or vindication of their own depravity. If I can't have it, nobody can. It's another way of saying it. Now, fortunately for us, Jesus has a last say. But his process for getting there isn't for us to destroy all of the evils of the world. He didn't, did he? He was God and obeyed natural sinful men and women. How much more should sinners obey sinners and authority? I know your feet may have just slipped off the pedals in hearing this, but the pedal scratches on your ankle will heal. So if we float around the Bible, we can find all kinds of kingdom scriptures. But that is not the point of this message, so I will try to avoid making this too complex a message in regards to that. So now that I am born again, who is my boss man? Who do I listen to? Only church leaders? Ha, huh, I had to throw that one in. Because it has been my experience that people, sheep, will only listen to you until they hear something they don't agree with. You see, the American church is of such thinking that because people feel like they volunteer to go to church, that they do not have to do any of the things stated at the pulpit. Just give me a Novocainic shot of scripture, and I will numbly go home. More on this later. I think. I have heard it more than once that I am no longer under or subject to the governing authorities of this corrupt governing system called democracy. Well, not exactly. So as to be sure you understand why it is important to listen to the earthly authorities and that it lines up with God's will for your life while you are still leaving footprints in the sand on this rock, I am compelled to dispel the myth that God is your only source of instruction. When I was a new Christian, I thought and believed that God was now my only boss man. This meant to me that you could not tell me what to do if it conflicted with what I thought God was saying. Oh, the unnecessary trouble that that line of thinking brings. And while if you do not learn quickly that this is not the case, then you will suffer unnecessarily. And in your small mind, you might even think it is for the sake of God that you suffer. Blah, fooey, fooey. May this message accelerate your growth if you now find yourself working against the governing authorities in the name of God. I get that the religious will attempt to discredit what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you, but so you know the tactics of the devil, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Even he was so stupid, if a spirit being can actually be stupid, as to use the scripture to discredit the word of God, that is the Son of God. And his name is Jesus. Matthew 4, 1, 11. Let's look at a new block of scriptures that will encourage you to live properly and in peace. Romans 13, 1, 6. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Yes, I'm going to take these apart line by line, precept by precept. Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and caught. Ken, is this a trick? Why interrupt scripture with more scripture? To me, all of scripture is a Holy Spirit alphabet soup, but it also helps to support my Mulholland and drive driving. That is to say, sometimes I weave in and out on a message to address some of the outlier questions. Now Isaiah presents us with a scripture that if, or as we take it apart, it will have one of two possible outcomes. It will either build us up in the things of the Lord, or we can fall backwards and be broken. If you have never fallen backwards, it's a bit of a shot of anxiety. Right in the space that you begin to descend, 
from a standing position to one of flying in the opposite direction that you can see in. Now, if you're going to go flying, you would at least want to see what it is in front of you. But flying backwards is anything but a trust fall. At 60 years of age, I have managed to do this on several occasions, and how I avoided injury is written in the Chronicles of God. Let's line up. Every soul means every soul, which is hard to dispute. As a Christian, you really can't get past this initial statement in Romans without having your old thinking challenged. Be subject. Any questions? For there is no authority except from God. Now this is meddling in both worlds. As if the initial statement doesn't cross over into the church as well, as into the natural governing authorities as well, right? And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. You know I got to go there, meaning where I've already been up top. Defund the popo. Who would say this in light of this scripture? The fallbackers would, and that is who, who. Look see what this states. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. So Jesus stated he is not of this world nor his kingdom, and that the world has a contrary ruler who is ever attempting to destroy humanity, even his own kids. But then that we are to listen to the authorities even if they are evil? Look at what I found. Proverbs 29.2 when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Are many of us not groaning in California, in the nation, in these years? I won't make this a political rant, but a man is known by their fruit, not their personality. Not whether you like them or not. By their fruit. No worries, because you will be measured in the same way. The Cyrus anointing is the lead election notice, not the voter box. Look again. All the authorities that exist. Verse 2 Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So I left this big bite because, well, I'm hungry. No. But so look again at what happens when you think it is up to you to listen to your boss or not, your parents, teachers, fivefold ministers, elected or selected politicians. Take a spoon of judgment daily. And call me in the morning. Now listen, submit and obey. Find peace from and of God in doing so. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. So is this saying for us to do good and we won't have to be afraid of the authorities? Yes, kind of. We have all seen the movies where the nice guy gets it in the end. Where the Hitlers of the world seem to always win until they don't. Leaving in their wake bodies, bodies, bodies. But for many, many, many of us, this is not the case. We will live out our lives without the fear of dying under Adolf Hitler or someone similar. But if a similar one does show up, let's see what Luke has to say about him. 12, 4, and 5. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. But so for most of us, we can and should, by our decisions, obey the authority set in place by God himself, live terror-free. Continuing with verse 3. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. Always good news in Scripture. Be unafraid of the minister. Yope. This is a yes and a nope together. It saves typing. Besides, we have a maybe, right? So we should have a yope. It's one less character than maybe. What this is not saying, at least, so far is that those in authority are believers. But it is saying that that person is a minister of good, if in fact you are submitting to their authority. If you do not submit, then they are not there to minister good but terror. And your disobedience is evil by this definition. I know, I hear the what-ifs flood coming down the pipe. Quick, let's move on. Perhaps we can outrun it. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. What? They had avengers way back then. And I thought we invented these stealthy superheroes. Playing with words can be fun, and, well, fun. 
You know where the comment, be afraid, be very afraid came from? The Avengers scripture. Okay, so kidding aside, we see that this is pretty clear. Funny how we hear, do not fear, do not be afraid, all throughout scripture. But in this scripture, we see that it tells us the opposite, if we are doing evil. Now, let's not get sideways. This is written to believers. Yes, believers can get sideways and do evil. If you want to find evidence of this, then go well to any story in the Bible. And you may find support for what I'm saying right there. Verse 5. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Is it just me, but isn't it funny that Dictionary.com has spell check? This is important to me because I have so badly misspelled words that my computer gave the ghost up. Maybe this is why I invented so many words. Inwardly, it may be a deep-seated struggle to find the correct spelling, so I outwardly rebel by adding these convictions to my dictionary, therefore justifying my use of the word. Okay, so again I depart to DCOM, and it states of the word that triggered this conversation, conscience. The inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motives, impelling one towards right action, to follow the dictates of his conscience. A complex of ethical and moral principles that controls or inhibits the actions or thoughts of an individual. An inhibiting sense of what is prudent. I'd eat another piece of pie, but my conscience would bother me. Obey them or our conscience. Either way, it works out for you in spite of their response to your obedience. Verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Now keep in mind that Paul wrote this stuff, and he went to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, 1, 4. And maybe, just maybe, he saw the taxes were good. Now aside from the abuses of the system, no, but wait, it's not God's system per se. As he already told us, he is not of this world. So can we really say it's abuses if it's the devil handling the coffers? Do we not expect a murderer to kill, a pig to snort? Why on earth would we expect that in every situation, kingdom principles would be at play? Because the kingdom of God is not here, right? Yup. Luke 17, 21. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. I know, I know, it's not a kingdom message, but some latitude, please. Wherever you're at, you bring the kingdom of God with you. The temple of God is never empty, right? 1 Corinthians 3.17 If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So do we judge the world and all of its expected behaviors? Nope. It's not my job to point out the sin in an unbeliever or to hold them accountable for their evil deeds. My role is to bring the kingdom of God with me everywhere I go and demonstrate its power in word and deed. 1 Corinthians 5, 12, 13 For what have I to do with judging those who are also outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Okay, we now drift into a 180 loop with a 360 loop. I have noticed that taxes and tithes are usually both fought by the same type of individual. Why is this so? I get that it may be a little difficult to pay taxes and then do it more than twice on a product you already paid taxes on and then pay taxes on your refunded taxes. And then when you sell the thing, you have to pay taxes on the item sold. No doubt we have paid taxes on items, double, maybe triple the price of what we originally paid for the item. This process can be a little taxing, but even so, we are instructed to do it because they are ministers of the natural world for our benefit. Jesus said to do it. Is he not your king? Pay your taxes. Now, if you are a believer, then why might tithing and offering also be a struggle? One pays the ministers of this world to manage the affairs of the devil for good. Now, that's God, no doubt. But the other pays for the church ministry so that the gospel can be preached, disciples made ready for ministry, Saints also equipped for the work of ministry, even for a building where we can congregate and have fellowship. Yes, even for a church address. Where healings and signs and wonders, miracles and the prophetic word spoken 
and the revelation of God's word taught. Yes, we pay rent to house the presence of God. Well, Ken, now that you put it that way. No, but wait, I didn't put it that way. King David did. Look at what he gave to build the church of God back in his day and see if you can find any apprehension in his actions and deeds. And didn't the people of that day overwhelmingly respond? I'm using this message translation in this example so that you can understand the monetary contribution in today's language. 1 Chronicles 28, 11, 18, 29, 3, 5. Then David presented his son Solomon with the plans for the temple complex, porch, storerooms, meeting rooms, and the place for atoning sacrifice. He turned over the plans for everything that God's Spirit had brought to his mind, the design of the courtyards, the arrangement of rooms, and the closets for storing all the holy things. He gave him his plan for organizing the Levites and priests in their work of leading and ordering worship in the house of God and for caring for the liturgical furnishings. He provided exact specifications for how much gold and silver was needed for each article used in the services of worship, the gold and the silver lampstands and lamps, the gold tables for consecrated bread, the silver tables, the gold forks, the bowls and the jars, and the incense altar. He gave him the plans for sculpting the cherubs with their wings outstretched over the chest of the covenant of God the cherubim throne. Here are the blueprints for the whole project, as God gave me to understand it, David said. Chapter 29, 1, 5. Then King David addressed the congregation. My son Solomon was singled out and chosen by God to do this, but he is young and untested, and the work is huge. This is not a place for people to meet each other, but a house for God to meet us. I've done my best to get everything together for building this house for my God all the materials necessary, gold, silver, bronze, iron, lumber, precious and very colored stones, the building stones, vast stockpiles. Furthermore, because my heart is in this, in addition to and beyond what I have gathered, I am turning over my personal fortune of gold and silver for making this place of worship for my God. 3,000 talents, about 113 tons of gold, all from Ophir, the best and 7,000 talents, which is 214 tons of silver, for covering the walls of the building, and for the gold and silver work by craftsmen and artisans. And now, how about you? Who among you is ready and willing to join in the giving? Now, if that doesn't sound like a tithe and an offering, I don't know what does. Look at King David's response. And I know some of you heard it when I said it in the beginning, but listen to this. This is not a place for people to meet each other, but a house for God to meet us. Is that not the purpose of the church? This is not a place for people to meet each other, but a house for God to meet us. That's the purpose of the church, aside from equipping the saints for the work of ministry. We go there to meet God. It's not the other way around. And this is why we don't invite non-believers to church. All right. I've been on that soapbox before. I'll get on this other one. So where's our response? What is our response? No, I don't see a downside to tithing and offering except for the occasional abuses. But notice that if there is someone who commits tax crimes, it doesn't let you off the hook for paying your own taxes. So why on God's green earth would we give ourselves permission to hold back on God's cash because Judas was assigned to hold the cash box? Well, that was quite a wonderful ride through Romans 13, 6 I hope that you see that the message of authority as it relates to our ordered response to those living on this rock as ministers of the affairs of men outside of the church. And they may be completely unaware that they are doing God's bidding as they operate in their position. But that's okay. This is why we tithe and offer so that we can, in and through our submission to their authority, that we might win some. They get some of the taxes and we get some of the tithe and offering. It can work in harmony together, even though oftentimes it doesn't. Did not Jesus create both the earth and his kingdom? Could he have just destroyed the devil rather than kick him out of heaven? Was he surprised that mankind through sin would hand over to Satan the authority we were given by God? You see, none of this is a surprise to Jesus. If someone legitimately had authority over you, 
then by all means, gladly listen to them and do what is expected of you. This is pleasing to God. So now let's take a look at what Peter says about our behavior and what it should look like in our lives. 1 Peter 2, 13, 17. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to the governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Well, let's big chunk this right out the gate. We must ask DCOM to help us with what ordinance means so that we have the completest of understandings about what Peter is saying here. Ordinance, an authoritative rule or law, a decree or command, a public injunction or regulation, a city ordinance against excessive horn blowing, something believed to have been ordained as by deity or destiny, ecclesiastical, an established rite or ceremony, a sacrament, the communion. So Peter is saying for us to follow the laws of the land, Without sounding religious, I want to express that we do so to the best of our ability. There may be times when it is not beneficial to another if you do so. In World War II, it was against the law to house or hide a Jew. Would you rat out their location for a loaf of bread to save your own skin? You see, sometimes we have to make choices, and they're not always easy. But we are talking about a life here, and we're talking about unjust laws. Some people did exposed the Jews, and turned them over for a loaf of bread to save their own skin, you know, because it was illegal, but others did not. There's a great movie called Schindler's List. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's very encouraging. So I also want to share that it's not our role to hold each other to the laws of the land. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. In the meantime, you do your best to comply yourself. Verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. You pray that you want to do the will of God for your life, listening respectfully to those in authority, and obeying the ordinance of the land is his will. Did Jesus not pay taxes? Matthew 17, 24, 27. Mark 12, 13, 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. None of us Christians would take issues with the selection of scripture that states, love the brotherhood, fear God. But honor all people, honor the king, the president of the United States? Is he talking about those who are also unsaved? Yes. Now, if there are some who are obstinate towards you, then pray for them. You do not have to hang out with them or even unnecessarily engage them. Respect? Honor? Yes. Matthew 5.44 But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Okay, so let's go back to honoring the king. Peter is talking about kings as well as governors, presidents, mayors, councilmen, assemblymen, senators, Secretary of the State, Prince and Princesses. He is talking about the ministers put in place by God. No, not ministers, but that they minister the will of God for our benefit. You don't like the president? Well, let's see what Paul's disciple Timothy has to say about it. 1 Timothy 2, 1, 4. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. You do not want to be the one who doesn't understand the need to honor authority. Back to Peter. Now look at what he says about those who despise authority. Second Peter 2, 9-10 Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Can you imagine that? Think about how many people speak bad about the elected officials. I know we're trained by the news media to do so, but that's not how God does things. Look at what Jude states in regard to the proper order of things, even when it has to do with the supernatural world 
of which we are all a part of. Jude 9. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Is he respecting the devil? Well, let's look at kingdom respect and authority and see how it's handled. One does not preclude the other from being relevant and applicable. Revelation 12, 7, 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, respectfully whooped. So now that we have in part covered authority, its definition, its application both in heaven and on earth, let's look at the S's and see how we receive authority and apply the authority given us by Jesus. You should know that with authority comes power. Now you can see why it is so coveted. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 1 Peter 2.5 and 9 You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does authority come with our position to God? In God? Yes. Let's look at my choice of a powerful scriptural trifecta. Luke 10, 18, 20. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Authority given to us by Jesus, in Jesus, manifested through the Holy Spirit, who is the authority of Jesus. Now you see another word that is synonymous with authority? Power, power, power. Too often it becomes the only reason why some want to be in a position of authority. Mark 16, 5, 18. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, does our operating in the authority of Jesus give us power over demons? earthly toxicity, and sickness and disease? Yes, they have the power to destroy, but Jesus has a power over the power to bring life. And now we see why being an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven comes with such care and responsibility. For some it's money, and for others it is a power. We don't avoid either, but behave wisely with their presence in our lives. Matthew 28, 18, 20. And Jesus came back and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Not all authority is flashy. In this command, we are to spend some time now making military replacements. By all accounts, if we were just to follow God's principles outlined in his word, we should be but the largest force in heaven and on earth. But the battle is real, and many get taken out. We lose peeps too early before they can finish their race. But so we, who remain until the end of the race, should have no excuse for not having our own replacement in position, let alone a thousand. So now we get to what happens when we abuse authority, or try and operate in a position not given to us by God. Now we know the motive, which is power and our money. These next few stories show that pride can blind us to the power of authoritative structure that God alone put in place, and that the price is highly paid when that structure is breached. 
We start out in the book of Numbers, whereby there are at least two accounts of a spiritual breach of authority. Again, if you are despising authority, those in authority, either spiritually or naturally, it will not go unnoticed by God. I will include both stories in their totality as outlined in Numbers. Cora has chatted about in other books in the Bible, and you can reference them at your own leisure, to see and learn from his example. I will not break these two stories down line by line, like I did Romans above, because it would require volumes, and we don't have enough gas for the journey. Besides, gas right now is expensive. Numbers 12, 1, 16. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, Suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O Lord, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in again. And afterward the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. So God heard Miriam and Aaron speaking against Moses. Talking bad or even gossiping about the person that God placed in a position of authority, and so he suddenly popped into play. Now both Miriam and Aaron were fortunate, because although Miriam is the one who was made leprous, God did heal her. Now why Aaron seemed to be free from the judgment of God is a little unclear to me. Maybe it is because Aaron is the one who confessed what they did as sin. I can only guess that it was Miriam who initiated the conversation, or perhaps she was unrepentant or her heart wasn't right, or perhaps some other reason I have yet to uncover. Number 16, 1, 50. Now Korah, the son of Ilzar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dothan and Abram, the son of Elab, and On, the son of Peleg, sons of Rubian, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and to all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy. He will cause him to come near to him. That one in whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them, and put incense in them, before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, 
and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abram, the sons of Elam. But they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they, as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it. And each one of you bring a censer before the Lord, two hundred and fifty censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took a censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dothan, and Abram. Then Moses rose and went to Dothan and Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dothan, and Abram. And Dothan and Abram came out and stood at the door of their tents, with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, with their households and with all the men with Korah, with all their goods, so that they and all those with them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel, who were also around them, fled at their cry, for they said, Least the earth swallow us up also. Then a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the two hundred and fifty men who were offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. But because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar, to be a memorial to the children of Israel, that no outsider, who was not a descendant of Aaron, should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. On the next day all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. 
So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it, as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And so the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this story. I broke it down in another message, but because I do not remember the title, you may have to listen to all of them to find it. But so the primary big picture in this is that Korah thought that his position in God was the same as Moses's. God assigned each one of them to their posts. But Korah wanted more power, prestige, and or position. Did not Miriam and Aaron say the same thing? Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? It's a strange thing when us humans compare our relationship to God with other people and their relationship to God. I mean, it's difficult to know exactly where each person stands with God anyways. But in this case, they saw God working through Moses in incredible ways, and yet they still had the audacity to compare themselves to Moses. They didn't have to carry the leadership weight that he had to carry. They didn't have to go through what he had to go through in order for them to even get free. You got to watch spiritual blindness. It can creep up on any one of us. Can I share with you the amount of times I've heard people say this? I should be a pastor or a pastor up on that stage. I can do what that guy does. Not if you haven't been called and anointed to be in that position. It's one thing to be able to preach the gospel in a five-minute message on the street somewhere. It's quite another to actually be a father of the house. A pastor just isn't a mouthful of words. His whole life is serving the people of God. And I've heard many people who said, yeah, I should be the pastor and I knew what their life was like, and they were not serving the people of God. They were just serving their own appetites. So yeah, maybe you are called to be a pastor. Maybe the season is not quite present for you to be in that position. Whatever the reason, if you start comparing yourself to those who have been installed by God, you are bringing judgment on yourself, and possibly on the others. Blindness often follows this sin. Even those who watch from a distance or in close proximity can be affected. So you think about it for a minute. Dothan and Abraham, they were standing outside their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Yet it wasn't their wives, their sons, and their little children who made that decision not to listen to Moses. And you look at Korah. He had 250 men of renown. These were solid leaders. And they followed him and got themselves burned up. And what about the 14,000 that died that also believed that Korah was right? They were just the regular sheep. They were the church. And yet they didn't learn from God's judgment when God judged Korah. They had to go through their own judgment, unnecessarily, I might add. You see, they may not have been the initiator of the sin, but by God, but by God, if you have the soil ripe for it, The seed can get planted and reproduce a harvest of judgment and pain. 14,700 bystanders learned this the hard way. You teach your flock that you are better than the flock down the road. You may not have a pasture in the not-too-distant future. In my message on darkness, it is evident that you may be able to hide who you are from others. But you cannot even hide your thoughts from God, let alone yourself. And he loves you enough to deal with it. In Chronicles 21, we see that David was moved to sin by Satan, the ruler of this world. And because of it, Monty God gave David a choice of picking door number one, or door number two, or door number three. Only it wasn't a 70s game show. 70,000 people died. Total collateral damage due to a leader who had authority. You want authority? You have it. As a Christian, you have authority. You have authority over demons, over sickness. You want more? Drop a dime on God and ask that he equip you for such a journey. 
the servant greater you will be. So we move on to a Peter and Jude perspective on some of the behaviors that reveal authority is or will be challenged. 2 Peter 2.15 They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. This isn't talking about the unsaved people. Evil doesn't have a right way about it. What is crazy to me is that Peter states they loved the wages of unrighteousness. Who could love such a production? Can you use power or money to produce wages of unrighteousness? Yes, so much so that you could depart from the ways of God. Not fair, you say? You're in a war. Stand there and watch from the sidelines and take a chance of becoming collateral damage. Or armor up, grace up, faith up, pace up, love up, and use the authority God has given you to advance the next generation of Christian soldiers. Jude eleven fourteen. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars, for whom is reserved a blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. So Jude calls out a woe on them. They have gone the way of Cain. This means at one point in time they were going another way. Both Peter and Jude talk about money as being the culprit. No, this is not a money message, but one of authority. You want more money? Ask for the wisdom and authority to master over it. At least it master you. So we come to the end of another great message, excluding any of the solely me in it. I've always wanted to do a message on authority, as honoring and being a servant in it seemed absent in the church. So in Romans, Paul is teaching us something profound and absent from lots of today's believers' lives. Live peaceably with all men if possible. This mostly depends on your position in Christ. Jesus did up to the very end, which is why so many have been impacted by his life. Romans 12:18. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Authority and power will come as you prepare to be able to handle it. You are released, are being released, and will be released in due season. However, keep in mind, your brass ring, if there is such a thing, may not be set as high as others. Your purpose is to swing from your own ring. Well, that's it for today. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from it. Together we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and kill, still, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of light to shine through into people's lives. Plant a seed and click on the like and subscribe button. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep waters.